Uh, so I guess a Vermeer is also in some ways a perfect machine. At least it's a perfect creation. Yeah, you know, uh, he, Vermeer painted about 350 years ago in Holland, part of the, uh, the Dutch golden age of painting, uh, where the painters were trying to emulate reality. They wanted it to mm -hmm. be like you were looking through a window. He painted the girl with the pearl earring. Yeah, Everybody's his seen most famous one. that painting. So just yeah. so people can get an image yeah. in their head of what, yeah. what we're talking about. And, uh, you know, uh, about 1839, when photography was invented, long after the Vermeer was dead and gone, uh, people started to say, hey, you know, these photographs kind of look like Vermeer's. That's weird. Um, and there is something photographic. You know, when you look at uh, adver advertising art today, you can usually tell if somebody started with a photograph to make yeah. their artwork. There's got a yeah. look to it. Or a little kid comes in with a, a picture of a cartoon character, a superhero. And he says, look what I drew. And it's obviously traced, traced right? right. And you go, did you lay it over the top of the comic book? <laughs> oh, yes, I did. How, yeah, hey, how did you know? Yeah. He invented it. And, and so there's that look that we can kind of pick up. Well, I was looking at um, uh, one of Vermeer's pictures called The Music Lesson. And, Beautiful painting. And it, uh, it spoke to me. It said, I am a photograph. And, but there were no cameras back then. So... There's been a lot of speculation about how painters could have gotten the shapes right and the perspective right by tracing a projection. You know, right. You can set up a simple yeah. lens and it projects right. onto a flat surface, and of course you can go in and trace that. But I suspected that Vermeer was tracing not only the shapes, but the colors. Because they're so accurate. Yes. And it turns out the human eye is incapable of seeing what Vermeer painted. And here's the way that works. There's a white wall in the back of his painting. Mm -hmm. When we look at a white wall, our brain and our retinas tend to interpret it as a solid color, right. even though it's infinite shades. Yeah. And it's happening right in our retina. There's image processing going on it's inside not in the brain. our retina. Not it's in the actually brain. in the eye. Yeah, and there's this local contrast enhancement that's going on that helps us see into shadows. So evolutionarily, it helped us uh, avoid prey, uh, avoid predators, and, right. and, and see prey. Right. Uh, we, uh, our, it's a motion our, detector. Uh, it's a motion detector also, but it's, it's also just trying to eliminate the effect of shadows. Right. Well, these, these walls that Vermeer painted had accurate shadows. And, and they, they shouldn't. They shouldn't. You can't see them. His contemporaries would make a lame attempt at putting a shadow on, but Vermeer nailed it just the way a video camera sees it. And that's what got me going. And I go, there must have been a there must have been a machine he could have used to do that. It's the only explanation. Now, and where is this painting? It's hanging in Buckingham Palace. The Queen of England owns it, and <laughs> you, you can only get in to see it. Uh, have you few, seen it? Yes, a few weeks a year you can get in and see it. Um, and when I started looking at these Vermeers in person, you know, not in reproduction, because you, it, I, we're showing an image on a 300 pixel image from the internet it doesn't do it justice no it's it's gone through a process at that point and, yeah uh that image you're looking at right JPEG'd there like hell was probably know. taken from like a medium format right. uh, film image right and by that time it's gone but you if you look at that back wall you, you can, can see, see something going on yeah there. The, the double shadow behind that mirror and behind mm -hmm. that harpsichord and if you look the the brightest part of the wall is right up next to the uh, window there the darkest part of the wall is down behind the gentleman clear to the right right and the ratio of light there it's almost pure black and almost pure white but it reads to us if we were in that room it would read to us as all beige Right. And that's what you would paint. And if you can't paint it, you can't see it. So, Could, Is it possible Vermeer trained his eye somehow to... You can't. You can't? You can't. You physically can't. The, the retina is built the way the retina is built, and it can't see that. So this is a little bit of a, a mystery. It is a big mystery. And um, So when did you first observe this? Uh, I was. Uh, I go to this trade show every year in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. the IBC show. It's a big broadcasting show, and the, and uh, I was at the museum, uh, the Rijksmuseum, where they have some Vermeers, and 
I was looking at the Vermeers, and uh, later, after looking at them, I go, this, I think I see how he did it. No. I think I see how he did it. <laughs> and so I went home. Knowing what you do about optics, about light, I mean, well, uh, it, it, it's actually more science? what I know about electronics. Really? There is a, a, an electronic circuit called a comparator. It's a very simple circuit. You have two signals coming in into this little black box, mm -hmm. and the comparator will tell you which one is higher than the other, right? Very simple device. And I reasoned that Vermeer had a, a, a very a simple analog form of comparator. comparator. It had to be analog. We're talking the 16th, 17th century. Yep. Yeah. So I went home and I did this experiment on my kitchen table <laughs> where I, I propped up a photograph and I put um, a panel down on, flat on the table to paint on and I set up this mirror at a 45 degree angle, tiny mirror on a stick. So I'm looking down in the mirror and in the reflection in the mirror, I see the photograph. If I look off the edge of the mirror, I see my panel down on, on the table. I took some paint and I put it on the panel. And now, right at the edge of the mirror, I can compare those two colors very uh, accurately. Uh, oh, wait, that is way too bright. Mix in some black. Wow. Okay. Once you've got it mixed and it's the proper color, the edge of the mirror goes away. So if it's too bright, you can see the edge of the mirror. If it's too dark, you can see the edge of the mirror. If it's exactly right, you can't see the edge of the mirror. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. It is not subjective at all. It's objective. You are a photo sensor. It's mechanical. You, Here's an image of uh, Tim uh, doing this from a photograph. This is from the movie Tim's Vermeer. Yeah, this, is, uh, this is that first test I did. Uh, my daughter walked by with her digital camera and took a picture of it. So that picture vertically there... So um, the mirror is attached to your glasses? No, no. no oh, I'm, you're looking through it. The mirror is glued to a mic stand. I see. And I'm looking down into it. And, um, and you see there uh, that on the table that I've made an exact copy of that photograph. This is the very first oil painting I've ever done. <laughs> you're not an artist. I'm you're not, not a, a painter. I'm not an artist. I've never painted in my life. Um, and That's it, quite and amazing. It, and it works so well, I go, okay. I'm on to something here. So I started Googling. I figured somebody in the world has figured this out. So I Googled for a day. I Googled for a week. I Googled for weeks. I, I, I Googled in other languages, German, Dutch, Italian, Latin, you know, looking for speculum. I'm looking for spiegel. I'm looking for kunst. I'm looking for all these words that relate to artists and mirrors. And I found a lot of stuff, but not that. You'd think if this technique uh, were widely used in Renaissance painting that it, it would be known. How was that he keeping is, a secret? That is the, one of the best arguments against this theory. But they had they had guilds, right? Like the free the Freemasons would not teach laymen how to lay right. out the first course of bricks. We've you know? lost a lot of techniques. Yeah, because, because of, of this. Because of the secrecy. Yeah, so they would have been keeping it all secret. That 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 is the explanation. Were there others of Vermeer's contemporaries who might have used this technique yes. if you look at their paintings? And now that I've been doing the research on it, I think I see this idea traveling through time and oh, across Europe. So how how did you tell the world about this? Well, um, after I did that experiment on my kitchen table, which um, is pretty impressive, that's a good picture. Yeah, uh, I surprised myself, and I, you know, I said, "This works way too well." Yeah, and it's simple. You know, it's right. elegant. It's mechanical. There's you just, can't go wrong. There's nothing to it. Um, so, I got a strange email from my friend Penn Gillette of Penn and Teller, uh, who I've known for Penn close was to also years. a video toaster fanatic. Yeah, yeah. And Penn, is that um, how you got to know him? Yeah. yeah, way, way back when. And um, Penn wrote me this letter, strange, um, desperate-sounding letter, email. He said, I have been spending all my time with my toddlers and at work, and I am in need of an adult conversation. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> Would you please come over and talk to me? Oh, that's great. And, you know, it's the weirdest email I ever got from him. So I, I said, sure, I'll, I'll come over. And um, we sat down at uh, one of these Brazilian steak places where they pile yeah. the meat on. And, and <laughs> Penn, said, Penn yeah. said, I do not want to hear anything about show business. I do not want to talk about politics. I do not want to talk about anything that could involve work, okay? What do you what got? What do you got? <laughs> and I said, 
Well, have you heard of Vermeer? I, I, I said, uh, <laughs> what do you know about Vermeer? He said, the painter? I said, yeah. He said, well, I, I went to his big uh, show back in New York uh, many years ago, and, you know, he paints you know, photographic photorealism. I said, yeah, my, I think I figured out how he did it. And he said, what? And, and I explained it to him, and then I realized it. I had it on my belt. I had um, a, um, a camcorder, and I had a video clip there where I had looked down through the mirror. Oh, neat. So you could actually show see him. it. And he says, I get this. I, I totally get how this works. It's sure, just, he's a magician. He's, he's a mechanical very, genius. very similar to a magic trick. It's, it's how they do these disappearing things. It's, it's called yeah. mirror masking in yeah. magic. Yeah. yeah. And so he said, I, I, he got I totally it immediately. get this. He understands yeah. the optics. And he said, what are you going to do with this? And I said, I, I'm going to try to paint uh, something that looks like a Vermeer. <laughs> and, and I'm going to try to put this, you know, make a YouTube video about it. And he said, that is a really stupid idea. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, you, let's make a movie, a real movie about this. Let's go to L.A. tomorrow and start pitching this. And that's how it started. And it just uh, snowballed and took on a life of its own. That, was ha that happened in February of 2009. And we didn't think it would take too long. But uh, we just finished the movie just uh, two weeks ago. You and actually said, I'm going to paint the music lesson. Yeah. So what I had to do is I had to... Uh, in Lightwave 3D, I made an exact 3D model of that room and all the furniture and all the architectural features of the room, reconstructed the room. You didn't start from Vermeer's painting. No. Holy I, I, I made cow. the 3D you, model. You from. made what he was painting from. So that once I had the 3D models, then I used rapid prototyping <laughs> and computer, a CNC computer-controlled milling machines and lathes to make all that furniture. Uh, I built a full-size replica of his studio uh, with the harpsichord, the viola da gamba, the wow. Turkish rug, um, everything. Everything was in there. And then I set up the machine the way I thought he must have used it. Not looking at his painting anymore. I'm, I'm now looking through the apparatus and trying to paint. And there were some false starts. There were, there, it uh, didn't work exactly right the first time. And it took me about seven months to paint it. And when I was finished, it, w it, it was... Did it, it look it was, like it? It was the same. It was the same Variety picture. wrote uh, yesterday, Peter DeBrugge, their senior film critic, so entertaining that audiences hardly even realize how incendiary it is. Tim's Vermeer stirs up a flurry of scandal in the hallowed realm of art history. Obsessive inventor Tim Jennison as a hunch, the only explanation for the photorealistic quality evident in the work of 17th century Dutch painter Johannes Vermeer is that he cheated using lenses or some other technological apparatus to achieve such remarkable detail. Jennison advises a five-year science experiment to test his theory emerging with an uncanny crowd pleaser, the secret weapon in Sony Pictures Classics Fall Arsenal that plays like the ultimate episode of Mythbusters. People are actually talking Academy Award for Best Documentary. How exciting. So exciting. Teller is involved too, right? Teller directed, uh, Penn produced. And Penn uh, narrates. Penn narrates, yeah, and he appears on film. Yeah. Um, I can't wait to see this. So... Uh, you show they showed it at Telluride. They're, I think they're still showing it. What did they? Uh, it's going to be at Toronto. It'll be at the New York Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And uh, do, did they have? A, is Sony's distributing it. Is, yep. it, is there a theatrical date? Yeah, uh, before the end of the year, they want to get it out before the end of the year in New York and L.A. I guess be, uh, because of the uh, Academy rules, they need to have right. It. Yep. Because you want to be eligible. Because uh, everybody's talking Oscar for this. David Hockney, the famous painter who did. A lot of photos in his in his artwork is is in it. What does the art world, what does the real art world have to say about this? We don't know. They're going to um, flip their lids. You know, it's been totally under wraps until four days ago. It's been total secret. Nobody knew about this film. So we suspect that uh, some of them will maybe change their minds, but others are so set in their ways. Um, that Hockney they, kind of intimated that this was Hock possibly what Hockney was going on. Hockney wrote a book called Secret Knowledge yeah. uh, 12 years ago. Uh, where he said something changed in art. About 1500s, 1600s, something changed radically, and I think it was caused by optics. Now, he didn't know my trick, 
but he thought they were tracing. You know, he right. thought they were just getting the shapes and the perspective right. right. And uh, he, nobody had really suspected there's a way to trace the colors. But and he knew because he's an artist, he could look at it and he said something. Yeah. There's a switch that got flipped. Yeah. And it's interesting because he realized that, but it took you to come along and say, I think mm -hmm. I know how they did it. Mm -hmm. So early Holy in the film, cow. we uh, before we before I started painting or anything, we uh, went to visit Hockney in England, and I ran the idea past him. I showed him the my first experiment, and I said, uh, "Do you think this is going to work?" And he said, "I absolutely think it would work." And, and um, I said, "Do you think that they were doing this in the golden age?" And he says, "Absolutely, I believe they're doing it in the golden age." You know more almost than the wall, though. I can see why the wall is convincing. I look at the tapestry here. And the detail yeah. in that, and that that looks like a photo. Yeah, uh, yeah. that is remarkable. You're looking at Vermeer's picture there, uh, and um, yes, this isn't. I should say this is not a Jenison. <laughs> this, right. this is a Vermeer. <laughs> yeah. When you were painting that, I mean, what what is your experience of painting it? it, it it's all mechanical for you, right? Yeah, it's it's a Zen thing. You, you're you're a machine. Yeah. Uh, all those little dots on that carpet. Uh, uh, are, are a different color. And the mirror tells you exactly what color it needs to be. And all you have to do is just sort of dab in the different colors <laughs> until you've got the right and one. And there it is. Yep. Uh, how close, you must have been highly zoomed in to do this, right? I mean, yeah. highly magnified. If you're seeing every dot in that. Not really magnified. It's The, the picture is 25 by 29 inches. Mm -hmm. It's laying flat on a table. And I'm about eight inches above the surface of it. So that's the kind of magnification okay. I'm seeing. And you're not doing any optical magnification. You're actually no. looking directly I'm at it. I'm looking directly at the canvas. And yeah. what kind of uh, brush were you using? It must have been a very fine. I used fine. Uh, a lot of different brushes, but they were all sable brushes. Very fine sable yeah. points. Yeah. And they're generally used for watercolor. Right. But um, that's what worked. And this is oils that you were using? Yeah. I had to, had to make the paint. <laughs> Um, because uh, I wanted to use only Authentic paints that he had. Pigments. We know exactly which pigments he was using because of the scientific analysis. Right. Uh, and so you were grinding lead? Yeah. And, yeah. Holy cow. And mercury. And, oh, my God. Yeah, very, very <laughs> Dangerous nasty stuff. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And how, what was the, how long, five years this, take, this took? How long did and this take? When I actually got the room completed and started painting, it took about seven months. From, from the, so the light wave thing was the first step getting it all mm -hmm. modeled out. Mm -hmm. And how did you get it modeled so precisely? I mean, that's, well, it, that's in, a challenge in, in itself. In Lightwave, you can do this, you can put an image in the background and you can wipe back and forth and you can overlay uh, lines on it. And then you make certain assumptions. You make assumptions that the walls are 90 degrees right. to each other. Right. And, um, and it'll add volume as, as yeah, needed. Yeah, and so by using those basic wow. assumptions, you make a three-dimensional model of the room. You were working from a, must have been a very high quality no, reproduction. There no, there were. Uh, the reproductions were all terrible. Uh, the one I'm looking at, which is the best I could find, is on iBiblio. Yeah. And this is actually a special site that they have for art. And it's, it's, it's I, you know, you zoom in on it and you see all the JPEG artifacting. Yeah, yeah. If you zoom, uh, pan down now to that harpsichord and the lower flap right there, the lower flap is just a mishmash of yeah. stuff. Yeah. But when I saw the actual Vermeer in Buckingham Palace, it's sharp as a tack. Yeah. Everything is there. So where did you get your copy? Did you go in and take a picture? No, <laughs> uh, I, I didn't have a copy. However, uh, that harpsichord... Though they still exist in museums. It, it was a, it was a uh, Flemish company called Rutgers, and those decorations on there were block printed paper, and the paper is still on those instruments. And so I had this guy in Edinburgh make me those papers so that I could construct that uh, instrument to look exactly like that. We know exactly what Vermeer was seeing because it still exists. Just slightly obsessive. You think? <laughs> you know, they, they have... Um, they what do have, your family think about this? They, ha they have medications <laughs> for this, but they wouldn't give, them, give me any until the film was finished. <laughs> no. I'm sure Penn's going, no, paint right. more. <laughs> uh, my family couldn't have been nicer about it. My, my uh, daughter posed. It's and, so cute. And, oh, she was the girl? Uh, yeah, and she had to have her head in a clamp for hours and hours and hours to hold her head Holy still. Holy cow. Um, well, everybody's raving about the L.A. Times, probably the, the biggest uh, rave. In fact, uh, the L.A. Times basically says that you're going to set the art world on its ear uh, with this, both inspired and insane.
he says. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> um, I, I am dying to see it. I cannot wait till it comes out. And um, I think a lot of people agree from the reviews that I've read that, that as much as what you're doing is interesting, if it weren't for it's Tim, Tim Jennison and how much they loved you and, and were taken by your obsession, that's really what makes the movie Yeah, the movie ended up being about, my, about, you. about my mental illness more, <laughs> more than Vermeer. Yeah. Although I just wonder what the art world's uh, going to say because in effect you're yeah. saying that Vermeer is not an artist. That he's a copyist. Well, I, I don't agree with that. I, I think he was uh, a, a very talented nerd. I, you know, I, I, <laughs> he I, did I, compose the image, he right? Did. He put the Indeed. image together, and he was trying to make a perfect image. He was Probably trying to make a beautiful image. As much an artist as a photographer today is an artist. And and you know, a better analogy might be what we do in motion pictures today. Right. We try to every we use everything we got to make a great looking image on that screen whether it's uh, computer generated or whatever we use we're not we'll use any technology any skill we can right, right. to make a picture and that's what they were doing back then you know it's it's uh it's the same thing well i tim i'm thrilled that we could uh, talk to you i think we got an exclusive uh on the success of uh tim's vermeer i can't wait to see the movie and 